beautiful people it's blessing here again and you are welcome to the channel if you are new to this space kindly subscribe to the channel like the video share and leave your comments in the comment section and to my returning subscribers super thank you for always coming back to watch my videos and in today's video we are going to be doing a reaction to a video titled america compared why other countries treat their people so much better this sounds so interesting so let's get into it and see what they got for us right here I'm going to say something that will probably offend many of my viewers. Let me preface this by saying that I, as an American, include myself in the following statement. I love that disclaimer right there so you don't get angry when you start watching the video. So I hope you're ready for that. Statement. Americans are quite possibly the most willfully ignorant people on the face of the planet. <laughs> we have access to the sum total of all- That was so blunt! <laughs> All human knowledge, yet our understanding of the world rarely extends beyond our own country. And even then, the majority of Americans believe in a vision of the country that does not actually exist. It's not that we're stupid, we just tend to blindly accept that the US is the greatest place on earth, and therefore don't see any reason to educate ourselves about the realities of the rest of the world. In this episode, we're going to pull back the curtain on how America actually compares to other countries, and consider why the richest country on earth fails to treat its people with dignity and fairness. I'm going to provide a list of important topics, then for each item we'll compare the American experience with that of citizens from other nations. Hopefully by providing a side-by-side -side comparison, you'll be able to see the stark contrast between how most Americans see their country and how it really stacks up against the competition. To give you an idea of just how skewed the American perception of our country really is, let's start with a pretty shocking example. Compensation for what are considered low-skilled jobs. We'll take the quintessential American company, McDonald's. McDonald's is the world's largest restaurant chain by revenue. It operates in over 100 countries and serves over 69 million customers every day. Oh, As of 2018, McDonald's was the second largest private employer, with 1.7 million employees, behind Walmart's 2.3 million. How many times have you heard someone refer to McDonald's jobs or workers in a derogatory manner? For some reason, people who work at McDonald's are seen as inferior or lazy or have any number of other unfair and unkind assessments leveled at them. This probably stems from the old notion of flipping burgers being a job anyone can perform. But the animosity towards low-wage workers has grown significantly in the past few decades. And in America, McDonald's workers really do suffer a low wage. As of 2020, the average crew member at McDonald's makes $9 per hour. The average McDonald's cashier makes $8 per hour. The federal minimum wage in the United States is $7.25. That's pretty, pretty low. Pretty low, like who's gonna survive on $7.25? Wow. A rate which has not been raised in over a decade and which should not be considered a reasonable wage for any position, yeah. considering the fact that a full time minimum wage worker cannot afford to rent a two bedroom apartment mm -hmm. anywhere in the United States and can't afford a one bedroom apartment in over 95% of US counties. Now, the all too common response to data like this is something like, well, yeah, it's not a hard job. You should just find a better one. Here's a simple question. Should any job, regardless of technical skill required, pay workers so little that they cannot afford to rent even the smallest place to live? Not to mention other necessities like utilities, food, and medicine. Absolutely not. That is inhumane and cruel, especially coming from the second largest employer in the richest country on the planet. Other notable objections include, McDonald's has to make a profit. If they pay their workers more, they might go out of business. First of all, if you can't pay your workers a fair wage, your company should not be in business. End of story. But again, McDonald's is not struggling to make ends meet. In 2019, McDonald's raked in $21 billion in revenue. That's a lot of income for a company. And the fact that these companies make so much money and yet underpay their staff is... It's something I am yet to understand. Seriously, like, how does somebody earn $9 per hour and you've got your rent to pay, you've got your bills to pay. If you're a family person, you've got your family members to take care of. That's really, really sad. And also, it's it's a wrong thing to look down on other people's jobs. As much as probably you've gotten the degree and all that and somebody is right there working in McDonald's, those mini jobs, I don't see it right for somebody to talk down and be rude to the employees of that company. But no matter how obvious the exploitation of low-wage workers, Americans are hell-bent on praising the very companies doing the exploiting. Take this article on Reader's Digest, for example. It's titled, This is what McDonald's workers really get paid. You see that and think, oh, nice. Finally, some news showing how poorly these workers are compensated. 
Then you scroll down and nope, they're actually praising McDonald's, saying things like, the food chain is also great for paying their workers fairly, and McDonald's is one of the highest paying fast food chains in the United States. This level of sycophancy is insane. If eight or nine dollars an hour is some of the highest pay in the industry, that doesn't indicate that McDonald's is paying fairly, it indicates that a massive chunk of the population is being paid poverty wages. This is where taking an international perspective is so critical. If all you see is feel-good stories about how well McDonald's workers are paid, you'll never know how badly American workers are actually being treated. Let's take the same company, the same position, but in a different country. Here's a McDonald's in Denmark. The average McDonald's worker in Denmark, for doing the same low-skill job, makes $22 per hour. Well, that's a lot of difference. $9 in America and $22 in Norway. Wow, a lot of difference right there. Hold on, you hear Reader's Digest scream from across the Atlantic. McDonald's workers in America get paid vacation days after just a year of work. Wow, enticing. In Denmark, when you're hired at McDonald's, not only are you making nearly three times what you would make in an American Mickey D's, you also instantly have access to a full year of paid family leave and a pension. No slaving away for a year to prove your value to the company. You're hired and you're treated fairly. Simple as that. McDonald's can afford to compensate all their workers like this, but they won't, because US laws allow them to exploit American workers to the point where they're basically slaves, earning the bare minimum to survive, paying all of their income and often going into debt just to pay rent, and having no way to escape this vicious cycle because they're working such long hours. This is the case across all of America's low-wage jobs, of which there are many. The plight of the low-wage worker is incredibly dire, and all you have to do to understand that is look at how those same workers are treated in other wealthy countries. Let's move on to another topic. And this is one of the reasons why you see somebody having two to three jobs just to be able to make a lot of money and meet up with the necessary bills they have to take care of. Life balance. Fair wages are definitely part of this equation. If you're paid fairly, you don't need to work a second job, which right. will free up your time to be exactly. spent elsewhere. But we're going to focus on other metrics, specifically the length of the work week, vacation time, and parental leave. Let's start with the US. Most Americans would say that 40 hours per week is full time. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the general consensus. But in keeping with the country's exploitative labor practices, the hilariously named Fair Labor Standards Act does not actually define what qualifies as full time. That's left up to the employer. Okay, why does this matter? Well, think of your past part-time jobs. Did you get any benefits? Healthcare, 401k, probably not. Most benefits, when they're offered at all, are reserved for full-time employees. Companies don't want to provide benefits because they affect their bottom line. America is all about cutting costs, mm -hmm. and providing workers with fair compensation is a cost. So, imagine you apply for a full-time job at Best Buy. You're offered the job, but they tell you they only have part-time positions, but they can give you almost full-time, they make it sound like they're doing you a favor, right. offering you more hours than normal part-time. But this is just another example of employers exploiting their workers. If you work 37 hours per week, you're essentially a full-time employee, but they mm -hmm. don't have to provide you any sort of benefits. No health care, no vacation, nothing. This is a common practice. Companies will hire people, but keep them just below the threshold for full-time to avoid providing fair compensation. I've seen it happen. I used to work at Best Buy and they would do it all the time. Wow. And that's just the companies who are still trying to appear generous. Others will simply not offer benefits at all, or set their full-time positions at 50 or 60 hours per week. Sales positions are notorious for this. They'll often say, well, we expect you to work 40 hours, but all the top sellers are working 60 to 70 hours per week. This is coercion. They're trying to pressure you into working more hours to benefit them, and the compensation is never what they claim it will be. By allowing employers to define full-time work, American workers are held captive by corporations, forced to either work absurd hours to qualify for full-time benefits mm -hmm. or find a second job to help cover the cost of things like health insurance. Yeah. Both of these options lead to a terrible work-life balance, and as real wages have decreased and benefits have been offered less and less over the years, huge numbers of American workers have developed an unhealthy work-life balance. For example, in 1960, when workers had real bargaining power, only 20% of American women worked. Today, 70% of children live in households where both parents are working full-time. And that is the truth. You have both, both parents have to go out there, make money so that they can meet up with the bills, they can meet up with everything they have to take care of. 
Where does all this lead? As of 2020, over 85% of American men and 66% of women work more than 40 hours per week. We work 137 more hours per year than Japanese workers, wow. 260 more than the British, and 499 more hours per year than the French. Why do other countries have such a better balance? Because many of them have laws that cap the length of the full-time work week. Companies are required to pay their workers fairly and allow enough time off for employees to maintain a healthy work-life yeah. balance. That's not the case in the US. Vacation time is a similar story. Whereas many other countries mandate that employers Seriously, when you keep working, all you do is just walk, walk, walk because you are trying to make money to take care of yourself, take care of your family. At the end of the day, it affects you mentally because you're not getting enough sleep, you're not getting enough family time, you're not getting enough time for you to relax and, you know, just think about your life and all that. It boils down to affecting one mentally. Provide paid vacation and sick days? The U.S. does not. In every industrialized nation, workers get more paid vacation days and holidays than in the U.S. Here's a depressing graph to illustrate just how poorly we treat our workers. France, 31. Spain, 34. Austria, 38. America, 0. Zero paid vacation days, zero paid holidays. And remember, these are the mandated figures. Every Austrian worker gets a minimum of 38 paid days off per year. Even in the worst possible employment situation, they'd still get 38 paid days off. In the US, many workers are lucky to get Christmas or Thanksgiving off at all. And the odds that it's a paid holiday? Next to zero. Let's move on to our final comparison, paid parental leave. Many Americans aren't even aware this is a thing, so let me explain. When an employee of a company has a child, sometimes they're offered parental leave, a period of time where they can stay home from work to bond with and take care of their new baby. Right. This greatly benefits the employee, the child, and in the long run, the company, because the employee will be happier, less stressed, and more loyal to the company. Of course, offering paid parental leave doesn't benefit corporations in the short term. And if there's one thing that encapsulates the American business philosophy, it's short-term gains over all else. Mm -hmm. So it won't surprise you to learn that the US is the only industrialized nation on the planet that does not mandate some amount of paid parental leave. This may be shocking to my American viewers because being able to get paid to spend time with your newborn child sounds like an impossible dream in our dystopian labor market. And honestly, it probably is impossible in our current America. We're so invested in self-destructive capitalism that even suggesting the possibility of paid parental leave would put US politicians out of a job. That's not the case in the rest of the industrialized world. In fact, every other OECD nation, and even in many third world countries, new parents are guaranteed at least several weeks of leave. And that's the truth. I know in my country, you get to be off work for 90 days. That's three months. I wouldn't know if they've increased it now. And in some other countries like Germany, I think you're off work for like a year. But in America, that's not the case. I think the highest you can even get is six weeks. I remember meeting a lady and she was telling me if she's going to be having birth through C-session, it's going to be 12 weeks. But if it's a, if it's a vagina birth, it's going to be six weeks. And I'm like, no wonder the daycare centers are open to accept your kids from six weeks old. That's crazy. <laughs> Let's take a look at a few of them. Ethiopia, a country with an annual gross national income of under $900 per person, offers 90 days of leave with 100% pay. Yeah. Madagascar, 14 weeks at 100%. Afghanistan, 90 days. Denmark, 52 weeks. Norway, 56 weeks. Yeah. France, 16 weeks at 100% pay for your first child, up to 26 weeks for your third, on top of 104 unpaid weeks. Wow. Lithuania, 52 weeks at 100%, plus an additional 52 weeks at 80%. Wow. Again, the United States does not mandate a single day of paid parental leave even for the mother, and the father is never considered. This means that workers in America have to choose to either pay the exorbitant cost of childcare mm -hmm. or have one parent quit their job in order to take care of the child. That's These true. are both bad options, which often lead to economic precarity. But that doesn't matter to the companies employing American workers. Profit is the only thing that matters. <laughs> Hopefully seeing these labor practices compared like this care. has made it clear that not only is the US not living up to its claim to being the greatest nation on earth, but also that it consistently ranks poorly and often dead last in terms of labor metrics. Why is it that the wealthiest, most powerful nation on earth can't pay their workers a fair wage or provide health care, vacation time, or paid parental leave? You should realize by now that it's not that they can't, it's that they won't. 
Everything in America is beholden to the almighty dollar. Profit is the only motivator. If an action does not produce a greater profit, it will not be considered. Over the last few decades, Americans have watched as our livelihoods, our quality of life, and our dignity have all been stripped away by those who already make obscene amounts of money. Those in power say we're all in this together, but that couldn't be further from the truth. The ultra-wealthy and the world's largest corporations rely on Americans remaining ignorant. They rely on us accepting the lie that America is the greatest nation on Earth, that it couldn't possibly get any better. All you have to do to shatter that lie is to take a look around the world. Other nations take care of their citizens. Even impoverished nations, or nations that we've bombed into oblivion, take better care of their people than the US does. American workers need to relearn the language of class struggle, and work together to break the wheel of the capitalist machine. If we want to claim that the United States is the greatest place on Earth, we need to make it that way. Oh, that was an interesting one to watch, as much as it might sound triggering to some other people, but that's the facts. Like, how do you give birth to a child, and when you give birth to a child, you cannot get your, your leave, your parental leave, and as much as you cannot get your either your maternity or your parental leave, you go for that leave and you end up not earning anything. Some of them might just pay you for a short period of time, and after that, they tell you they cannot pay you and they can't pay you again. And it's so interesting to know that some other countries from Europe, from even Africa, third world countries, even treat their employees even better than what happens in America. Wow, I enjoyed watching this one, and it's so expository. It's so enlightening, and I hope you've learned one or two things from this video. So if you're new to this space, subscribe, like the video, share, and I'm going to see you in my next one. Bye-bye.